welcome in. Happy March. Happy March. My name is Shelly Willis. I am the Senior Director of Collective Impact, and I have been given the gracious honor at this meeting uh, by Tamar Jackson, Kelly Brickhouse, and Chloe Wilhelm to be able to moderate or facilitate this great group of uh, thought partners in a special space. Uh, we are happy to have you here. We host this meeting every other month, and it is a space where through our leadership team here uh, at Workforce Central, which is your Pierce County Workforce Board, where we have a community engagement arm, and this is our community, our Pierce County Community Engagement, our task force uh, that meets, and it's uh, just a gathering of community leaders, uh, investors, stakeholders, champions, the like, you name it. And this is our space where we operate and really discuss things through keeping equity in the, in the center of everything we do through a lens of equity and the great work that we're doing in the community. So there are multiple ways in which the community engagement team does that. And I'll be able to let them expand on what they're doing and how they're doing it. But if you are new to this space, we want to encourage you to come back. We want to encourage you to uh, lean in and participate. And uh, like I said in the chat, let us know if it's your first time and introduce yourself in the chat. Like I see, I love to see it. And we record this meeting so you can go back and you can watch it again. So don't worry if it doesn't all sink in while you're participating. Um, you can come back and you can um, you can watch it again when Chloe sends out the link. And also any updates to any resources or information that was shared, we'll be able to get that back out to you as well. So we're going to kick it off with a land acknowledgement. And then I'll be turning it over to Tamar Jackson and team to go into updates. And then we'll get to the meat of the matter of why we are here and what our topic of discussion is today. But uh, Tamar and Kelly will be able to expand more on that as we go through the day. So I will turn it over so that we can do our land acknowledgement. Thanks, Shelly. So I'll start with our land acknowledgement this morning. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Pierce County home. These are the original homelands of the Nisqually, Puyall, Silicon, and Muckleshoot. It is important to move beyond acknowledgement and reflect on your own history that brought you to this place. This land acknowledgement is one small step in an ongoing commitment to improve our support of indigenous communities in the area. All right, I'll turn it over to Tamar Jackson and Kelly Brickhouse. Y'all take it away. What's up, Kels? What's up? Your hair looks fabulous, by the way. Your hair looks fabulous. Why, thank you. <laughs> What's going on, everybody, man? Welcome to March's task force meeting. I'm not going to be talking long because I am going to be kicking it over to the Brick House and Chloe, but uh, welcome for all those that have just came. Um, I love this space. If you've been here for a minute, you know how fun this space can be. Uh, the space was really created so that way the work that we do in community, we do not have to do it alone. We can do it as a collective, which is the way it should be done. We definitely understand that no one organization can save our community, but a multitude of them. We can kill the game out here like we've been doing. So thank you. Please continue to keep coming. Um, it's absolutely incredible. For those that do not know, Tamar Jackson, Senior Director of Community Engagement and um, a member of this fun club that we call the Pierce County Community Engagement Task Force. Again, like I said, won't be talking long. I'm gonna kick it over to Kelly. It's been incredible. Penny, I, I just love you and thank you for being here. I've been excited about this for a minute, a collaboration that y'all ain't seen, but we pulled it together. So go ahead, Kelly, do your <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks for coming today, everybody. So in case you don't know, I am Kelly Brickhouse. I am Community Engagement Coordinator at Workforce Central and been part of the task force since day one, which is amazing. I love to see all these new faces on here and returning faces. We're going to have a talk. Why you haven't all been here so long? We're talking about that pretty soon. So um, I'm super excited for today. We're going to go through updates uh, after we do the these presentations, but we brought together today an amazing, amazing panel. So we have 988, 911, and 211 in the house. Uh, that I mean, it's just so cool. So often we're trying to serve many, many people in crisis um, and trying to figure out how we can better do this together. So Tamara and Chloe and I were like, who better to bring on to talk about where a lot of the phone calls go first 
and how we really as a community can collaborate with them, how we're sharing what our organizations do um, and just figuring out how we can better serve. And I know one of our goals, I think when, when Penny, uh, Courtney and Diana get on, we're going to learn a little bit about how many calls they get, what those calls are about and maybe how they can um, direct some of those to us as a community as well. After they do their short presentation, we're going to open it up for, for pretty much like open questions. And I hope our task force does what our task force always does. And that is ask, ask, ask everything you want to know. Um, no question is off the table, right, Penny? No questions off the table. So we want to find out everything we can. And again, just like see how we can better serve our community and really work towards stabilization. Um, so I am super excited to introduce Courtney, Diana, and Penny. Um, I'll do a, a little, I'll say Courtney is our director of 988 services. Um, she's going to talk to us about what 988 does. That is probably the newest line that we have here. And then Diana is the communication center manager for 911. And I hope y'all know Miss Penny Belcher, who is the South Sound 211 director at United Way. And we're super stoked to hear from her. And if I do believe, Penny, we're kicking it off to Courtney, right? And Chloe, if you could make Courtney a co-host, that would be great. And she'll take us through a little presentation. We have a few questions to start it off. I've prepped our panel with that, um, with some of the questions we're going to ask. And then you all can fire away. I just ask that hey, raise your hand um, during this as we have so many people on and we'll go ahead and call on people in the best order that we absolutely can. If you're a little nervous about asking any questions in front of this group, which you shouldn't be, if you know us, like just, just throw that hand up. You can go ahead and put it in the chat and Chloe and I will monitor that as well. So we are going to kick it off early as from what I understand, these three folks have a very busy schedule. <laughs> so I'll turn it over. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, Courtney, were you going to uh, share the slides that we brought? Um, yeah, absolutely. Give me a second. We'll just bounce off of each other um, as we go through these these slides. Um, like you said, Kelly, we, we knew we were going to focus on the Q&A and, and really want to spend some time on what questions everyone has. So we'll, we can go through this fairly quickly. But I think... Um, yeah, it, it'll address some of the, the questions that you sent us yesterday. You can go to the first slide. All right. Thanks so much, Kelly. Really excited to be here. This is my first time on this platform. I'm excited to talk to you all about 988. And Diana and Penny and I will talk a little bit about how our three-digit numbers work together. I gotta fix my screen so I can see what's going on better here. <laughs> Just a second. Um, some of you have seen this uh, visual that I, I uh, shared before. I think it's just a really nice way to show on a very high level, each of the three three digit numbers um, that's available statewide and what uh, each do. So of course the 911 for emergencies, 988, Yes, Kelly, you're right. That's a newer number. And I think there's a lot of people that are still unaware that 988 is now the phone number for um, suicide um, and crisis support. And then 211 for kind of anything else that's community resource based. Um, but I like the, uh, the Venn diagram because it shows how the three of our organizations behind the scenes are committed to coordinating together so that we're not operating separately um, and so that it can really be a network of crisis and care support um, and that, you know, we can set up these systems of coordination behind the scenes to make sure that everyone reaches the appropriate type of service um, and that we don't lose anyone along the way. So it's, it's very exciting. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, just a few kind of points on 911. I feel like I have the easiest one to talk about um, since we learned 911 starting at such a young age, which is great um, so that everyone knows where to call in an emergency. Um, 
and just working on education for all these different resources that people I want to say now, but it's not really now. It's just um, trying to get the word out for our other th three digit numbers also. Um, but our goal is to provide an urgent or emergent response to potentially life threatening situations. Uh, that diagram that Penny had, you know, shows a number of things. It could be a reporting a crime. It could be a fire or medical emergency, or it could be a police emergency. Um, we do receive quite a few calls that are related to mental health or basic needs. Uh, and then for our center specifically, we are a regional 911 center. We consolidated over the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, so a lot of you who've grown up in the community you may know there used to be multiple comm centers, and if you called 911, you'd get transferred to another uh, 911 center to help you. We've tried to cut out a lot of that potential delay by consolidating. We're now the uh, largest call volume in the state, um, and we answer over a million emergency and non-emergency calls a year. We also are one of the PSAPs in Washington who have text to 911, um, which we get quite a few text messages, but our motto is, Call if you can, text if you can't. Um, our, our one of our big groups that text to nine one one really supports is our deaf and hard of hearing community, um, or people in situations where they can't safely speak to us. But if someone can talk to us, we can get a lot more information from background noise or even an open phone line uh, than we can from texting. And we support nineteen law enforcement and seventeen fire EMS agencies. So if you're thinking about Pierce County. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're thinking about Pierce County, uh, we support all the law and fire EMS agencies except for Tacoma Fire, um, State Patrol, and uh, the Tribal Police. Uh, we just work closely with them, but they're not dispatched out of our agency. So 988 is a continuation of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which has been around since 2005. So it's a new way to reach something that's been around for a while. As of July 16th, a federal bill mandated that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline could be reached by calling or texting 988, and the name switched to the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. So we have seen across the state a 47% increase in call volume since that launched and, and over a thousand percent increase in chat and text. So quite a bit of volume and we expect that to continue to grow as people become more aware. 98 provides a lot of services beyond just suicide prevention. There's emotional support, crisis de-escalation, suicide safety assessment, safety planning, connection to resources, and then follow-up. And follow-up is a it's a short-term uh, light case management linkage to resources that includes some more in-depth best practice safety planning. So at Volunteers of America, we cover 32 of 39 counties in Washington state for phones, including Pierce County, and we're primary coverage for the state for chat and text. And we also are really fortunate to host the Native and Strong Lifeline, which is a Washington state crisis line for Indigenous people entirely staffed by Indigenous people, and that launched November of 2022. Uh, contrary to the name of uh, Volunteers of America, all of our staff are paid professionals, bachelor's and master's level. Uh, so that's a common misconception. Another common misconception is that you have to be in a suicidal crisis to call 988, and that's not true. We really want people to call proactively before a crisis develops. Uh, so it could be just a bad day. We we believe that crisis is self-defined. Um, 211 uh, is the line to call for community resources. Um, basically at 211, we try to be very comprehensive, very wide. Anyone can call with any need and any question. Um, that they want, and we will work with them to try to navigate all of the programs and services in our three county region. Um, so for those that don't know, at United Way of Pierce County, our South Sound 211 Center covers Pierce, Thurston, and Lewis counties as our region. Um, we, we kind of think of R211 as having different levels of service. There is information and referral, which I think all of us do, um, which is that basic information um, about what services are available, how to access them, et cetera, et cetera, and providing that 
to folks um, and sending them on their way. Um, at South Sound 211, we have uh, implemented training for our staff to work to have longer and more creative conversations um, to coordinate with most of our service providers that uh, hope to empower our callers to find their own solutions and problem solve to identify what would work for them best, which takes a little longer than the basic information and referral up front. Um, we do uh, provide screenings, intakes, filling out applications, for certain programs. And that's usually, again, through collaboration. If there's service providers that don't have a call center or capacity um, or need more uh, outreach, then 211 can kind of act as that place and access point um, to do all of that on, on one call. Um, still, primarily, we have the same top requests um, is always housing. Um, at the top, which I know is no surprise, housing and utilities, um, and then legal and government services. And, you know, actually some of the legal can, uh, when we break that down, I sometimes pull it out because a lot of the legal uh, requests that we get are related to housing in this region as well. Um, and then transportation and food. So it's a little over um, 74,000 contacts is for 2023. Um, and then I'll just add that um, kind of the deeper level of service that we have with some of our partners in Pierce County is um, specialized resource navigators that will take that uh, even further and spend a little more time with clients or a little more time tracking and connecting with those service providers. So we do that kind of in those top areas of need, um, housing, uh, coordinated entry diversion services, transportation, uh, workforce development, and then also um, family parent caregiver. We're the uh, family resource navigation point for uh, the early learning network as well. So while 911 and 988 are separate services that serve separate purposes, there is some a lot of collaboration between the two something we're really excited about that we're doing between Volunteers of America and South Sound 911 with Department of Health as the funder and the overseeing entity is the Mental Health Crisis Call Diversion Program that we launched last June. So this is the first of its kind in Washington State. It was modeled after similar programs around the country. There's one in Austin, Texas, one in Tucson, various ones around the country that have uh, been successful and we wanted to bring this to our community as well. So the vision is to divert mental health calls from the 911 system. So those mental health calls receive a mental health response via 988 instead of a, a 911 or law enforcement response, um, if that is what's appropriate to suit the community members need. And so in this program, we co-locate 988 crisis counselors on site at the South Sound 911 comm center. So they're working on the floor with the 911 telecommunicators and they'll get calls that contain, we have criteria for what calls can be transferred and those calls that contain a suicide or mental health component, uh, but are not imminent can be transferred uh, to 988 as the response. And then because they're working on site, they can work very collaboratively if there is anything co that comes up that is imminent and needs to go back to 911. So from 2023, we saw an average of 82% for a complete diversion rate of those 911 calls that our 988 co-located counselors interacted with. Just pretty standard for what we're seeing around the country. So we're excited in 2024 to be expanding out to 24 seven coverage. And then looking at the larger 988 system, in less than 5% of the calls that reach that 988 system, a 911 intervention may be required. And we consider this a last resort. We really value least restrictive interventions. Uh, we really only do this if we think the person will die. If we don't, it tends to be collaborative where they're working with us to get help on the way. And Diana, if you'd like to speak to uh, the impact of the diversion program on the, your team. Sure. Yeah, it's something that we're really excited about from the 911 perspective as well. Uh, if you, you may know different call takers or dispatchers that work in this industry and one of the areas that they have felt for a long time 
that I talk to these people and I follow the policy or the procedure for what's supposed to happen. And then I talk to them tomorrow or I talk to them next week and I'm seeing that they're not necessarily getting the right help. So even if they're getting some kind of uh, help, like if you know, you think of the 911 system almost simplified down or dumbed down to like call in, need to send help, right? Like they're getting something most of the time, but is it the right help? And really trying to connect them to the most appropriate help for their situation is something that this program really does. And for our call takers and our dispatchers, they saw the impact immediately of just, I, I feel like I'm actually getting this person help. And a lot of times it contains someone's name because they do talk to some of our familiar callers on a really regular basis and they want to get them the right services that they need, the right help that they need, and to actually get to the root issue and not just kind of put a Band-Aid on it for that day. So we're really excited about um, what we were able to do with one um, counselor co-located, but for 2024, having 24-7 coverage, uh, it's just a really exciting time for us. So there's also a lot of collaboration between 988 and 211. So as I'm sure we're all, we're all aware, the resources that 211 provides, lacking those resources can be a significant stressor on someone's mental health. So 988 gets a lot of calls where they might be the stressor might be related to basic needs not being met. And 211 is one of the most common referrals that our 988 counselors will make and our follow-up team will make. Uh, those follow-up services utilize 211 often in the initial client goal setting. So when our follow-up counselors work with the client, they'll start out with, what are your goals for the next three weeks? And often that is, well, I want to get connected to someone for, for housing, or I want to get my finances in order so I can pay my utilities for the next three months. And so that's something 211 is a really good resource around that. Um, and then Penny, if you'd like to speak to on the 211 side. Yeah, in the same way, um, people can utilize the 211 number when they, they know that they're, they have one of those stressors, so they may be facing eviction or something else is going on. Um, and, and so, of course, during the conversation, um, after that initial request for a, a program is made, is sometimes when they present with thoughts of suicide or um, they reveal the crisis that they are truly in. So two on one, um, you know, in those cases, is trained just to de-escalate to a certain point to stay on again to follow kind of those um, procedures to make sure that um, that they can stay with that person and then get them warm transferred to nine eight eight for them to really work with the the client at that point. And then, it, you know, it's it's a little more uh, unique that there would be a 911 call at 211, but it certainly does happen. Um, sometimes, again, because uh, folks can call 211 with any presenting need at all, they can actually be in the middle of a situation um, when they reach one of, one of the 211 uh, specialists or navigators. And um, so if there is something that is life-threatening, um, those, uh, those would be transferred or, again, depending on how threatening the situation is, we may have the person hang up and call 911, just depending. Um, and then, oh, Diana, do you want to talk about the other direction? Uh, yeah. So for the other way that we can also incorporate is... Um, I, wouldn't, I guess I was going to say a lot, but sometimes it feels like a lot of our callers, the, the root issue is, is a basic need in connecting them to 211. We don't currently warm handoff callers to 211 very often, if at all, but through 988 or through a field response, either from police or fire or medical aid, uh, connecting them with 211 is essential for getting them those need, getting those needs met to try to help with what the situation is or their bigger situation is. So our vision for the future is the 
I've been calling it the three digit club, uh, but definitely these first two bullets kind of go hand in hand. We'd like to see greater integration of 911, 988, and 211, and also more community engagement and education to enhance the community's connection to health. And so, yes, we want people to know more about what number to call for what type of crisis they might be experiencing, but we also want it to be almost a no wrong door approach so that if they do call any one of the numbers, we can behind the scenes help them get the help that they need with the, the just path of least resistance for someone in a, a really difficult situation. Um, also, we're hoping to see enhanced capacity for contact handling. So just making sure staffing levels are up to par to keep up with the increase in volume we'll see. And then expanded service delivery, like for 988, that looks like an expansion of our follow-up services in addition of next day appointments, referrals, and just more help beyond the initial crisis contact. And then uh, between 988 and 911, like we mentioned, we are excited to see in increased staffing in that diversion program and an expansion of what types of calls might go from 911 to 988 uh, that would appropriately meet the community members' needs. And then Penny and Diana, if you'd like to add to this, please feel free. Um, yeah, I think you, you covered it really well, the things that we've talked about in moving forward. Um, I think that again, we you know we do we need to be really thoughtful about uh, what the experience of the caller is, and so I'm excited that I'm learning from the work that's already been done with nine one one and nine eight eight, um, and kind of a, a pathway is kind of emerging that if it goes to dispatch and then goes to the nine eight eight counselor. Um, and then once the crisis, you know, is stabilized and those basic needs come up, it may or may not be um, a time right in the moment that we would need to come in with our navigators for and connect them to programs and services that 211 can offer. Um, it sometimes may be on that follow up, but we need to be able to figure out the channels of access and be able to offer whatever it is that that particular person needs and whatever their path looks like. Um, and so this work will, will continue and 211 is becoming more and more engaged in, in what some of these workflows would look like and digging into data in order to prepare for the future and really kind of learn and model from the diversion that um, 911 and 98 has already done. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Penny and Courtney have really hit kind of the nail on the head. And I like how Courtney phrased it as the no wrong door approach where the, the community education is always gonna be important. Um, and for me and conversations that Courtney and I have had over the last year is I see a generational shift too when we look at our kids um, and kind of the future, like looking at the long-term. Um, like 911 is all I, I remember learning about. Um, when I worked here, I remember learning about the 211, 311s, the suicide prevention number that I'd have to look up to give to someone, right? But um, I have kids in elementary and junior high and high school, and they're talking about 988. They're talking about these different three-digit numbers and resources for people and different conversations that really just weren't there when I was growing up and I grew up in this community. Um, so I'm just excited to think about the future even though I want to see the impact right now on where we're at and adults and children and everyone in the community. But if you call the wrong number, let us connect you to where and who can help you with what your situation is um, and how Courtney, Courtney said, you know, crisis is self-defined. So let's help people get in contact with the right, because you could call 911 and I tell you that you should hang up and talk to somebody over at 211 because they can help you. But what if what if the one phone call you were going to make was the one that you already made and you get off the phone with me and I hope you make the call, right? But you don't, I didn't help you at all. And then I might talk to you down the road or I might see another call or situation that involves you. And as a call taker or a dispatcher, they're wondering, like, could I have done something different? Could I have helped them differently? So um, just really getting us all around the table is important and looking at what we can do and really kind of redesigning what um, we grew up with and what we can provide for everybody who's coming after us, so.
lots of information. That was amazing. Thank you. And I saw some questions popping up in the chat and I'm certainly, uh, I certainly wrote down a few and we definitely have some prepared for you as well, but I'm just going to start us off because I, I, I know you, you all have so many services, like connections to services. Um, so one of the first questions I actually wrote down is, so as we're a lot of providers in this room, can 988 be used by providers for connections to substance, like help with substance abuse, mental health, and so on? Because I would say that's one of the things we see um, going through emails all the time is where can we go to get the people we serve help? So is it something we can use? Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's something that's crisis oriented in nature where you want to just kind of collaborate on what's a good crisis plan for this person, what would be a good next step for the point they're at 988 can be a really good resource for that. We do have access to a lot of local resources and we have pretty good, we have good collaboration with our regional crisis lines. If there is like a, a mobile outreach of some kind required that might be able to go more in depth into what resources are needed, but 988 can be a really good starting point. So yes, absolutely, please call us. I'm paying attention to the chat. I guess some people have static. I don't. Oh, just when I'm talking. Okay, Chloe, why don't you kick us off on questions? I see. Thanks. Thanks, Carissa. I guess that's me. Be quiet. I got it. <laughs> if it helps at all, I'm no longer hearing static. So it may have just been a one time thing. <laughs> Gosh. All right. So again, thank you all for, for being a part of today's meeting. It's a lot of really wonderful information. Um, I'm curious, at least in terms of um, our kind of work for community engagement and our kind of connections. I know you mentioned um, education and awareness being a really part, important part of that. Um, are there partnerships that you're seeking? Are there areas where you're saying, oh, we could be in this space more, we could use more help from these areas? I'm thinking, you know, as attendees of this meeting, how can we help you? How can we jump in to help um, increase that awareness, access, um, or just where, where do you see that need being? So I could start for 988, then Penny and Diana, feel free to speak to your, your three digits. Um, but for 988, so we have dedicated positions for community engagement, and we also have a DEI coordinator, and they work together to make sure that our most vulnerable communities are reached and that DEI is woven into our, our supervision practices, our service delivery, and our community engagement efforts. So right now, our, our main focus has been uh, partnering with schools in the area. Our community engagement coordinator has many events set up where he's going to go talk to students and make sure they're aware of 988, answer questions, and just put a face to the, the service they'd be calling. That's really important, especially for, for youth and uh, rural communities. Uh, those are kind of the big ones we're seeing that they, they want to know who they're calling, which is valid. Um, and then as far as integration between like 211, 911, we're trying to be present where we can uh, so that the community can understand and have more education around what the differences are. So I guess if I could, for 988, uh, speaking for us, if I could make an ask, if there's any, any opportunities you know of for community events that it would be helpful for us to have a present at, presence at, we would love to hear about that. Uh, particularly if there are any organizations or events that are working with um, high risk communities, we'd really like to make sure we can be present there. I can jump in next. Um, we have a community engagement and community education team also. A lot of their presence is, you know, going to elementary schools, going to community centers, educating people on 911 and trying to make that face-to-face -face contact so people feel comfortable um, reaching out to us when they need help. Um, also, it's just some education on trying to get in touch with us, but we have had a lot of conversation uh, recently about um, working more collaboratively with 988 and 211 and um, like in the city of Tacoma, they have 311, but trying to help people um, find the best, I mean, the most appropriate help or get them in touch with the best resources and how we really 
are one group and we all have the same goal. Um, and we've just been fragmented for so long that I love opportunities like this where we can come together and say, look, here's where we're similar and here's kind of each of our specialty and how do we get that message to the community? So um, just kind of looking for areas to improve if you guys have ideas of where we as 911 can become more engaged in the community. Um, I know our teams are always looking for for more than the normal, you know, community community event or uh, elementary school education program. Yeah, I would I would say the same. I think opportunities like this um, are great. Again, just for the education piece about what each of the uh, numbers provide, but also understanding that piece that we that we are coordinating um, together uh, to try to improve you know, going forward um, as well. And and then for 211, I guess the only other thing that, um, you know, that we always put out as an ask is just all of that information on the service and resources. So the the engagement opportunities are, are great. We don't have um, a large outreach team. So we kind of depend on people like Kelly and those that do the communication and kind of speak on our behalf when we can't be in the room. Um, but the the services that are provided by all of your organizations, um, you know, we do a lot of nagging, we do a lot of emailing, we do a lot of calling of kind of staying up to date in that huge resource database. So, you know, my request of everyone is always any updates, anything new, any changes, we would really love that you would just contact me or anyone that you know um, at 211 or our general email so that we can keep on top of that. Penny, actually, that brings me to an amazing question, and and I know uh, I already saw this kind of come up on the on the chat a little bit. So as far as calling into two one one, so that can be challenging for providers because we want immediate gratification, as do most of our customers, clients, and participants. So we don't, I would say, as providers, we don't a lot of times have the option to you know be on hold for any amount of time. Is there a way that, um, and, and I think I, I actually know the answer to this, but I want you to cover this. Is there a way for us to access your database and be able to pull up similar resources that say somebody on the call line would give to, to that client? Yes, and so we do work with a lot of partners um, to, uh, to kind of get, tour them of the public interface. There's a public website at wa211.org. So that's going to be the statewide um, database. And then you can filter it down to um, for whatever uh, type of assistance or whatever region of the state that you need. Um, but if there, you know, if you'd like to dive a little deeper, we do have resource staff that work on that database as well. And we, we could always offer to have, you know, um, an in-depth tour and maybe some tips and tricks and things like that about how you can use it in the way that our trained resource navigators um, are using it. Um, and so, yes, um, part of the, um, the, the question again about the hold times is because uh, as a state, even 211 is uh, under capacity right now for the need. Um, and so, you know, I'm always 100% transparent, you know, with the group about that, that the hold times are high due to um, being understaffed. Um, and so, you know, support in that way is, again, kind of this education and outreach um, to people also about uh, if you can support 211, we know that we can improve that service. Um, and so, you know, this time of year, um, like Shelly was saying, you know, working with the state um, and other funding sources, but the partnership that, you know, I mean, R211 can, continues to work on these collaboratives, like workforce development and creating other way access points, if you will, um, to have our system partners be able to contact us on behalf of their clients in a way that they won't have to wait in the main 211 queue. Um, there's also the email, which is 211 at uwpc.org, um, which is another way to access their services. Um, so we're continually, you know, looking at that and trying to uh, shorten the wait time to speak to a navigator in other ways 
while we are trying to staff up. I think that's amazing. So, I wanted to, oh, hold on one sec, Tamara. I want to, before I lose Lori's question back there in the chat, I thought that I was, I'm going to try to find that again. Lori, do you want to jump on and ask about Alice families in particular? Because I think that's a topic that we're talking about so much right now is people that have like fallen over that benefits cliff or are in a, you know, a place where their income, they're not necessarily able to access benefits. Lori, do you want to tag on to that at all? Sure. Yeah. It's something that we see a lot in the libraries. We get families who come in with um, one or both parents working. And so they have completely lost any type of traditional public assistance. And, you know, for our staff, it would be really helpful that we could take back and say, hey, this isn't only going to be a pathway for super low income. It's going to work for our Alice families or even Alice Plus, where they're, you know, they're working and they've got this income, but it's it's already only covering the basics. We know how expensive housing is. We know how expensive gas is right now. You could have a great job and still barely be making it and need help with clothes or food or, you know, one month of utilities just so you could catch up. It Can we still send them your direction and know that there is a pathway for them? Um, and that's 211 specifically, but also, of course, it it's preventative of them having to call 988 or 911 also, right? So, um, yeah, just more any more information on that would be really great because we tend to see the super low income, but not necessarily uh, where they've got a good income, but could prove on paper that they're just barely making it. It is. It's a... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Penny. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Tamar. No, I was about to say, uh, thank you for bringing that, Kels, because you, you know how I feel about that one. Um, two things, going back to Penny real quick, is um, it, her ask is very simple, and I think most of us know 211, 988, and 911 are only as good as we can support them. And what they do is absolutely incredible because they do the things that we don't do. They hear stories that we don't hear. Not even gonna lie, I didn't know 211 got the calls that they did until a friend of mine was like, think about it. That's the universal number for I need help with anything. That's the first place that I'm going to call. And so we started having a conversation around it. It was like, oh my gosh, I never knew that they called 911 for housing. But they do because it says emergency and I've lost my house. And so, you know, when we think about our new programs, when we think about new partners and new collaborations, you know, thank you, Penny, for just telling us to reach out to you, because the more that they know is in community, the better that they are able to serve community. The more resources that they understand, the more that they can answer the questions, which allows us as providers to do the work that we are actually meant to do, which is to handle business and be in community. You know, I've always said it. Everyone in this phone call has community somewhere, whether it's in their title it's in their heart, it's in their background, it's in their mind. We are all based on how we serve community. The more collaboratively that we do it together, the better that we serve community. And I think over the past few years, we've gotten out of our way, you know, and that's why we created the task force. So yes, 911, 988, y'all are always more than welcome because this is the community. To be honest, I'm not going to toot my horn. We are the best at what we do as a collective. We got everybody in the building. And I love that because our relationships are so different. So we can serve and we have to get out of the way of having someone have to call a number. Let's get the direct contacts. Let's be able to sit and go and say, hey, let me put you in front of somebody that can take care of you and make sure that things are done. But also going back to what Lori said, we also have to put in the mindset that, hey, there are families out there that are doing good and making wages but it takes that one paycheck or that one bill that throws them off key and off till. And then all of a sudden, well, what do I do? What is there for me? Well, if we can sit and support them in what we're doing, then guess what? They don't have to come into a system and start all over, which is keeping their dignity and keeping them moving forward. Sometimes it is just an assistance on a light bill. Sometimes it is just buying a new coat. I'll tell you right now, it may say they don't fit our program and you can't have a coat, God damn it, give them the coat. Give them the coat. I mean, it is what it is. You're serving community. And, you know, um, 
thinking outside of the box, thinking about what we're doing, thinking about how we're doing it. We all know DEAI is in that point right now that we do have to keep it at the forefront of everything we're doing. I could tell you honestly, DEI has become an organizational thing. It, 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 it lost what it was two, three years ago, and it's starting to become more organizational. Keep that in mind when you're planning, when you're looking at policies. DEI was created for a reason. That's why you don't hear me say it. I say DEAI, because now we have to talk about the accountability, the awareness, the acknowledgement, our ancestry. What does all these things look like and why are we continuing to keep these at the forefront? Well, they're there so that way we can serve our community because we all know it's very diverse. It's very marginalized in the work that we do do. So we have to make sure that we are serving with dignity. We are making policies with purpose and we are collectively collaborating to make sure that we are not just removing barriers, but we're kicking down boundaries too. Because again, we already know this system. We understand this system. Now you think about it with 52 calls right now, we're still trying to figure out what this system looks like. Imagine somebody that's not in this space, not in this circle, how hard navigating a system that they say is for everybody to get through. They're not going to get through it. That's why us being together is so important. That's why us collaborating is so important. That's why us talking to each other is so important. We have to stay out of our own way. The more egos, the more all this other stuff happens, the more trauma that we bring to our community and we aren't doing anything. We got to stop trying to win the argument and start solving problems. I think that's the biggest thing we can do collectively. And before I get off here, hi, Mary. I love you. I miss you. Class 28. My bad. That was selfish. That was selfish call out. Hi, Mary. He said class 28. Carissa, question. Yo, so I have a quick question. Actually, there's two of them. Number one, if there was an organization that is either newly developed or has been in existence, how do they become part of 211? You can contact any of us from, from 211, and then we have a, a process where we gather the information um, that's needed. We do have uh, an inclusion exclusion criteria that um, that we look at and and follow, and then we just communicate back and forth to to get um, that organization into the database. So the two one one at uwpc.org will work, or myself, or as someone else mentioned, Sarah Teague, um, or any of our navigators um, can get you connected. The website uwpc.org itself, if you go to the two one one page also lists um, contact information. So if it's easier just to tell people to go to the United Way website, um, yeah, just just contact okay. any of us and we can start that process. Okay, and then question number two, and I may have a little bit of a follow-up question, I'm so sorry. Question number two, have others, as they go through and navigate the 211 system, is it updated often? Because I know that sometimes contact information changes or services changes. How often is it updated? Is it, um, so, because if I give somebody the number to 211 and they're already kind of at the end of their rope, kind of it, in desperation, and does, ha, is it, do you know what I'm asking? I'm sorry. Yes, it's it's okay, updated perfect. as as much as possible. Um, so uh, the, the standard statewide is just to update once a year. Um, clearly that, that that's not, we update more than once a year. Um, however, there may be some of those types of resources in the database that aren't updated as often. Um, okay. And again, it's like, it depends on how often things change. Um, but that is, um, you know, we're always rolling that boulder up the hill. We always have since we started a database and we always will yeah. be it's constantly, yeah. constantly, constantly asking people to share updates um, and information. So, you know, we get, we get, you know, we are calling shelters every single day. We're not waiting a year to update. Like we are, we are looking yeah. at, you know, same with our transportation, you know, providers um, and wait times and that kind of thing. You're, you know, you're looking at daily, weekly, monthly, 
and so on. But it depends on the type of service. We, you know, we certainly cannot contact every single record in that database every single right. week or month. So it depends on the nature of the service. And then we're just always asking for that kind of help and support um, to please let us know if you know of changes or updates. We're happy to follow up and do the legwork on it. We just we just would love to have the the heads up if something changes. Okay. And then the last little sprinkling. Um, do you have like any videos or anything on what it is that you kind of talked about, like a quick snippet video that as we're out talking to community, we can utilize that in areas to either share what you are about or just that if there's organizations that could plug into possibly they can see that video. And so if you don't have one yet, I'd love to be able to share something like that. Um, at 211, we we have we have different videos some of them are customized a little bit for certain audiences that sort of thing so Carissa that's a really that's a really great question I can take that back to the team and see um if there's something you know that we can use generically and if not then certainly we want to create that I think that that's great um I know that there's there was a, a short basic video um the state 211 released not too long ago uh, that talks about this um, crisis system network between 911, 988, and 211. Um, and so I can share that, Kelly, with with you, um, if you for you to send out for everyone, and, and that that might be helpful too. Unless um, Diana, Courtney, uh, anything on this subject of a video? I'm not sure if you're if you you know the one that I'm talking about that came from Law 211. I am not familiar with it. Okay. And that's, that's something we can help with too, Penny, if there's something that uh, needs to be created. I mean, we'll absolutely share and we can help create anything if you want. You know, I love the camera. Tamara loves it more than me, but I love the camera. Um, Miss okay. Sarah. Well, just to jump in super quick, um, if you have any resources that you want to share out with the group, um, you can email to me as well. Um, I'm in a lot of different spaces, so I can send out a lot of those times of resources. I'll put our main task force email in the chat. So if there's anything that you want to share with the group after the meeting, of course, you know, we'll have notes, hopefully with the slides as well in the meeting recording. So um, I'm happy to send that out. I'll put my email there. But I do see some other hands raised, too. Um, Kelly, is that where you're going to go? I know I kind of. Yeah, we'll go okay. Sarah and then. Yep, Sarah. And then we'll go. McKinley, who I've seen in so many meetings lately. It's great to have you on again, McKinley. Sarah, kick us off. Good morning, everyone. I just have a question about the language access for non-English speaking. Um, how do you manage that? I can jump in and start for how we manage it. We utilize the language line. Uh, so if there's a language barrier, um, we'll get the language line on the phone for interpretation services and the 988 counselor that's co-located with us has access to the same opportunity. I guess I'll, I'll go next um, for 211. Yeah, we use a over the phone um, interpreter service. Um, we uh we have had navigators who are bilingual in different languages um over the years uh right now we don't we have so many open positions that we're trying to fill right now um but uh in any case we we use the interpreter um three-way conference call for for 211 calls thank you Courtney, are you still, did you didn't, did you take a stab at that one, Courtney, with 988? Oh, I saw really quickly in the chat that she had to step away for just a couple oh. of minutes. I'm not sure if she's logged I back on that. but hopefully when she, when she gets back, we can circle around to it. Great question, Sarah. Actually, that really came up. I'll get to you, McKinley, I'm coming. That actually came up last week in that one of the Homeless Coalition email was uh, looking for Latina shelters, and I was, I was surprised. Oh, I mean, I was and wasn't surprised at how few uh, resources that people actually knew for for that specific population, which 
yeah i got i, I have a lot of questions on one too. i think it's also to know if they're serving undocumented folks um because a lot of our yep. populations are not documented but everybody have issues and they have problems and they need help so i think i did respond to a couple of resources that i knew but yeah i think that's yeah. another issue so uh, that was can I add another question to that house? Uh, the, if there is any resources for undocumented folks, people that don't have insurance or they don't qualify for insurance or they don't, because I know a lot of the grants and monies that come for these supports are federal, but there is any other part of money assigned or allocated to serve these populations. Penny. Can you uh can you take a shot at that one? So when uh if and I'm sure it happens often when people call two one one. Actually, I know it does. I was just talking to Janae about this last week. What's uh what is the process for? Do you have a collection of resources in various areas for folks that are undocumented? Um, you know, I can't speak specifically to what the resources are because again, that's that would be in the database, the process would be the same. The process would be a conversation. We'll talk to anybody. You can give us your information. You don't have to give us our information. And we're gonna just keep searching through that database and try to find find the resources. But I can't get specific on what um, programs there are. Um, but again, certainly if you want me to uh, to check with the team and and have them send you some information, get, you know, just contact me. Okay, McKinley, sorry about that. I gently decline your apology. Thank you. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, hi, Penny. I miss you. Um, so I'm kind of like split between a personal and professional hat on this topic right now. Um, so and I'm not like trying to be like a downer or pessimistic or anything like that. I love the resource navigators and like um, all the work that's being done in these areas behind the scenes because I know that it's very um, it's very hard work um, and there's you know, uh, that lack of, of resources, both staffing wise and just in general. Um, presently, I am not comfortable referring people to 211 or 988. Um, with 988 specifically, I've had two bad experiences um, kind of with how that went um, and then really no capacity um, to kind of like try to follow up with anyone um, to give any kind of feedback or like find out, you know, if, if that's like a persistent thing at all. Um, and then same with 211 in the professional context, the times that I've supported clients or just gotten feedback directly from clients who have called 211, um, it's not like, um, it's not like they've had a bad experience because of anything to do with like the humans themselves, um, but just like the nature of the support that they were or weren't able to kind of get directed to. Um, and so like, and I have a lot of folks who get, who get to the resource center from 211 and then oftentimes they're asking me for resources and I might be connecting them to like Tacoma Community House or other places where they didn't necessarily get that information but also I don't know that they shared it or not um, in detail enough to to have like a, a 211 resource navigator um, be able to you know identify that that could be a support for them um, so I just wanted to bring that into the space because I I worry about um potential harm that's happening unintentionally um, and through all the different kinds of like barriers and things that we have, again, not through any fault of like specific humans themselves or anything, because I know that they are all very wonderful. Um, so yeah, I don't, not necessarily a question, um, but if you all have thoughts on it, I'd love to hear them because I, I want to feel comfortable and confident referring folks to these resources. Yeah, no, McKinley, thank you. I mean, and and you know that you've heard me say this before. Uh, if uh, you know, if that's um if you know of experiences, then then we need to know. Like, um, of course, you know, because again, um our our goal is always to be constantly, constantly um improving the, the experience. Um and yes, again, you know, I think we all know that um, you know, there are going to be things that happen. There's, you know, sometimes um there it, maybe it isn't the best you know it's hard to say um kind of you know without that and again i've been transparent about um you know where we're lacking i think that again um 
I really appreciate that you bring it up um, and that you're willing to support in that way. Um, and that if you, you know, if you're willing to talk directly with myself or, you know, someone else on the team that you're more comfortable with about specifics, like we dive into those specifics every time that we get feedback. Sometimes it's something that we are able to, um, you know, find a solution for immediately or a small improvement again, you know, in the interim while we're looking for larger capacity. Um, but certainly if it's, you know, if it's things that have to do with the resource database, or again, if, uh, you know, the experience with a navigator, we just want to know, like, we just want to know, and we're not ever going to, um, we're not ever going to ignore, and we're certainly going to always be grateful and appreciative if you're contacting us, um, so that we can try to improve. Um, that's kind of part of what this whole, um, initiative that we're talking about today with the three systems, right? We're trying to get out ahead of that and look at, again, you know, what is a person's experience in these three statewide systems? And if we can come up with an idea of how we can be connected to do a better job on all of this, then we can have that ready to present either to partners on how you can help, how you can contribute, how you can support, or again, to funders and um, decision makers at the state that need to understand like this is the way that it needs that it needs to be done. Um, and so, yeah, just contact me. And again, you know, you know that I love <laughs> how you are always the one to speak up <laughs> for us, McKinley. Yeah, I, I know. I felt more comfortable because I'm like, this Penny, you know me. Um, yeah. And I, I know that a lot of it is like partially a capacity thing. Um, and then so um like since the time that I've been here at the resource center um, and prior to that, um, I had been doing like this kind of work, connecting families with resources for about six years. And um, it's like the the quantity of time that I have to then do the follow-up is hard and that's on me. So I'm like also for my own accountability saying this, that like I need to be making the time in those instances to reach out um, because sometimes it's just so hard because we get caught up in like the next person in front of us or whatever. Um, so saying this for myself as well. Um, yeah, because it's it's like I said, I want I want to get back in that place where I'm, I feel confident in it. And McKinley, I just want to thank you for bringing that up about the bad experiences with 988 as a person speaking personally as someone who's called the suicide prevention lifeline for myself. I have feelings about what the client should experience when they reach out. So I definitely you and anyone else on here who's had a bad experience or worked with a client who's had a bad experience, please reach out to me. I would love to hear more about that. Uh, we should be incorporating feedback like that into our service delivery, our supervision, all of our operations. And then something else that might be of interest to this group, there is a state subcommittee that's a lived experience subcommittee that informs the entire 98 statewide efforts. Um, so that is a place where you could inform a uh, 98 for all three 98 centers in the state. So I I can look up the contact information for that and drop it in the chat or email Kelly later. Um, but yeah, McKinley, I dropped my email in the, the chat. So please, please reach out. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, and then I also just, this is my first time coming to this meeting. So this is just in general for like everybody because there's people here that like, I'm not familiar with your organizations and connected with, and I would love to be so I can make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm sending folks your way and you can send folks our way. Um, so after this meeting, Kelly or somebody does like, everybody's information like as far like flyers and things like that go out or is there like a shared folder where everything's dropped into or can I support anything like that for <laughs> yeah um that is a great question um Marissa I'll get right to you I see your hand up too so there's a couple of ways that we do that so we do have as part of the Pierce County Community Engagement Task Force we do a network power hour um we pretty much do that glory, uh, quarterly and that kind of gives all of us as providers a chance to get together, work with each other, talk a little bit about what we do. Um, you know, as Tamar said, like this system is impossible to navigate. It truly is, even for us as providers. So we know that warm handoff, like that direct warm handoff goes a long way. So that's what we do in Network Power Hour. We'll usually have about five or six presenters or on a specific topic and then really let everybody have time to connect. Um, we can do it that way. As for a shared Hmm. We've talked about this so many times before, a shared, a shared folder. 
We've actually tried this multiple times. We've tried a newsletter. We've done a whole lot of things. I would say we, one of the best ways we have to do things right now is our task force Facebook page, which is open to everybody in the group. Um, we drop a lot of things on that. Um, and then, you know, we share out as often as we can, but McKinley, definitely we have a lot of different committees and initiatives that you can join throughout through the task force. You can hop on those and, uh, and help kind of craft something. I know Norman also, I said to Norman, Hey, are you writing down these resources in the chat? Because these are really good. And his reply is, aren't you doing that? I'm management. So I think that it, is. <laughs> I think it was that by is accident. Someone else is in my office typing on my computer. It really wasn't me. Please don't hold that against me. <laughs> Well, and I, because um, if people are asking about in-person meetings, I'm also thinking like normally, right, we would have walked away like from an in-person meeting with like a stack of everybody's flyers or outreach materials. So kind of like replicating that in this space. And then yeah. last thing I'll mention too, um, and I know Penny's familiar with this. So previously to this, I worked at Pierce County Early Childhood Network. They had um, a resource navigation and access team. One of the projects that I'm trying to do now at my current position was around this sort of idea of having like a community database for providers on the provider side that even documented things. And I, this is like very big picture, like long term, but documented things like what organizations have a bilingual staff member, what organizations have um, wheelchair accessibility, what organizations have um, like just different factors that are important to know so that I could go in and say, show me all of the folks that are able to support families in Ukrainian or show me all of the folks. Um, like I said, I, this is still a project I'm trying to work on amongst everything else. So it's a lot more slow going now um, of just doing it on like the back end. But if that's something anybody's interested in like collaborating on, I'm definitely interested in that um, because it's all, it's a lot of stuff that's in my head right now. And I know it's in y'all's heads um, that I, I think it would be great to have it in a way that is like, you know, who has ASL interpreters who had like all of those kinds of things that aren't necessarily something that 211 has capacity to track, nor do I expect them to, um, but could just be like a, a thing for providers specifically to go into looking at, not that it would be like, like clients wouldn't be allowed to see it or something like that. Like it wouldn't be gate kept at all, but just that it's a resource that we could go into to better do those warm handoffs. I love that. It sounds like I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at my, my chat and there's a lot of people messaging me right now that they have a lot of interest in that too. So I would say that's something that we, we could all, we could help pull together pretty easily. Um, Marissa, I want to get to you. I know you've had your hand up and I'm so sorry, like fire away. <laughs> it's okay. I, um, just wanted to echo what McKinley had been talking about, about having not just sometimes we remember those poor experiences, but we've also had positive experiences. And I think what's really nice about groups like these is you continue to network with other um, individuals who give other providers who participate in these meetings direct access when they're not getting the services that they need through those numbers, like 911 or 988 or 211, because they're not always um, accessible because of the staffing, but also maybe we're not asking for the individuals not asking for the right thing that they're looking for. I think it's good to bring up when we do have those negative experiences because um, as providers, when we network, we kind of create these workarounds rather than bringing the issues to light to that number. And so that those issues never get problem solved or improved upon. And so I just want to thank you for letting me um, sit in this meeting today because it's really nice to hear um, other people are also experiencing the same challenges, but opening the conversation on how do we make it better is the common goal of why we're all meeting today. Um, my secondary question is, I know for internally for providers, some of you have provided your internal contact to further explore some of those challenges. And we also mentioned individuals with lived experience. Um, I've worked with families or individuals in the past who have also wanted to vocalize the challenges that they've had through the system. And so I'm just wondering, of those people who are calling 911 or 988 or 211, is there a, ge a general number or email that they should contact to get in touch with someone to vo vocalize those concerns? 
So I could speak to the 988 and thank you, Marissa. I really appreciate your, your perspective on all of this. So for 988, if anybody were to call and say, I had a bad experience, I want to tell someone about it, the counselors are trained to direct them to the right place to do so, which is through the Vibrant, which is the overarching organization that routes the calls. Um, and they have a really thorough investigation process where they look into it on their end. They reach out to the center, they prompt us to do an investigation and we have to report actions taken. So that's the best way to go about it. They also have the opportunity to speak with a supervisor at our center. And this is pretty standard for 98 centers across the state. And I can answer for uh, 911 if there's a negative experience or an extremely positive experience, which I know is uh, Oftentimes what we forget to also call in about, I do that same thing myself when I'm, you know, negative versus positive. If you call our non-emergency line, they will transfer that caller to the supervisor where they can uh, review the audio as well as the call that was entered or the call that was not entered um, and follow our quality assurance uh, review process. Uh, and then it's all documented and they can communicate with that caller to try to assist them with what they needed or what they what they truly were looking for that they didn't receive on their initial call. It's, it's the same really at 211. Um, if anyone wants to again use that email or um, or call me or the number and ask for a supervisor, then we follow that same process where it's then documented. We do um, listen to call audio, follow up with people on the call, follow up with the um, with the person that shared that experience after the fact. I love that. And, you know, this is a good time, too, to talk about be, as we do have so many new faces on this meeting today, again, through the task force, you know, as part of our like community and uh, community engagement and outreach uh, group and initiative, we have what we refer to as the Speakers Bureau. We've been trying to get that back off the ground for a moment. And that is really not only those that we serve and their voices and their stories and their lived experience, but it's also ours. It's also ours, knowing that so many of us are in that quote unquote, like messy middle, just coming out of poverty and in that, you know, income bracket. So we will send out a me, <clears throat> sorry, we'll send out an email um, about that in the next week or so. But that's a really good opportunity for us to share lived or to share lived experience. And if you know myself and Tamar and Chloe, like we know that we have to we have to do systems change. We have to advocate. We have to change policy. Like that is going to be the key to it coming down to everybody in our community. So we're really trying to do that together. Um, I know I have two more questions in here. Penny, are you, you guys still good? I know you have about what, 14 minutes left or are you still good? Yeah, I'm, I'm good for now. All right, Ellie. And then Tim. All right. It took me a shockingly long time to figure out how to raise my hand. I'm just going to admit that. Um, so one of the issues that we face at the library is uh, obviously that a lot of you have expressed is the long wait times for some of the services like 211. And unfortunately, we no longer have these things called pay phones. We have a lot of folks coming into us without a phone or with an uncharged phone or a phone with no minutes. And we do not have um, courtesy phones available at long lengths for many of them. So a lot of our patrons, they can come in, they can stay the full day, but we don't have a phone to give them for four hours or six hours. What is the probability or has it ever been considered for services like 211 and 988 to provide courtesy phones to organizations? So when we have these folks who can stay in places for a long period of time, but maybe we don't have a device to give them to make that call, um, is there a, are there any solutions for that? Or have we considered um, courtesy phones? I could start Penny and then if you wanna jump in. Uh, so for 988, we do work with our like our, our ASOs and our regional teams to see is there a way that we could have some flex funds to provide people with phones. We have pretty limited control and influence over that when it's it's kind of beyond the 988 system. But what 
we have done is try to increase access and opportunity through offering different type ways to reach 988. So the chat service is something that if there are library computers available, that's something at suicidelifeline.org, someone could reach 988 through the chat service and we could help connect them to resources there. It's not a perfect solution. There are some limitations with certain resources only being available by phone, um, but that's that's where we're at now. And we're definitely, we've received a lot of feedback about this being a barrier. So it's something we're, we're working with um, at the state level to try to figure out some solutions. Yeah, we haven't actually provided um, courtesy phones or again, you know, but have the resources to do that. But we have talked about, again, always continuing new channels of access. So, you know, we are looking um, at chat as well. Um, but in that case too, we've also discussed, well, then would we give, you know, other, uh, you know, not the libraries, of course, that would work for that particular situation, but would we look at giving out um you know, tablets or something in the community then in that case, or would we look at installing kiosks? Like, I think pretty much all of it has kind of been discussed or maybe you know, piloted slightly, um, but but we haven't really hit on anything that, that works for all. So I think we just are, again, continuing to try to work with partners um, to figure that out. Um, and then also like, Again, what you know, what is that? What can we provide to the providers? What can we provide to um, you know our friends that are in collaborations like this? Um, you know, when there's a time when two one one is not going to be the place, we want everyone else then um, to know what we know and to share the information and find the resources and and all of that too to kind of find those solutions. But we have not um, actually talked about the ability to provide the courtesy phones. I love that. Um, geez, our chat is just on fire. It's I, you know, I, Tim, I'll be right to you. I want to recognize the library. Like I think with everything we've talked about, like having resources at or the ability to have this or a space or a way like Lori and Ellie have been right in there, like library, 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 library. And I think that is so important. <clears throat> they have been working so hard and I will vouch for this on really creating um, space at every single Pierce County library. And, and Tacoma has been including that a lot too, as to how we as community partners can get in there and help people. Now I have to say, it's all about coming back, coming back, coming back and having the community know that you're there on a regular basis. So, and I also think it's really good to point out, especially with, with 211, well, 988 as well, that it these services are as good as we as partners make them. We can never expect United Way and 211 to come and meet with every single organization and say, what do you do? Come in from a present, come in for a presentation. I mean, Penny was just saying they have 74,000 phone calls. Can you all imagine getting 74,000 phone calls to your organization and trying to direct those? So, you know, it's again, everything is as good as we make it as a community. And that's what this space was really about. So I would encourage us all to continue this conversation um, as well and see how we can we can help out more and especially and partner with the libraries. That's for you, Lori. Tim, I know you have a question. It's burning up. Oh, good morning. So I actually made it in here in time, I guess. Good to see everybody. So my question is with 988-911, uh, I'm Tim Fairley. I own Tacoma Volunteer Outreach and Resources. I also do highly promote 988 and also getting some peer counselors into 911. A uh, lot of the feedback I'm getting from 988 is that they don't want to call it because they know it's a government line that can track you. And I've been trying to hide that part. Um, is there a way you can stop putting that on the promotions of 988? That way we can encourage more people to call. And then with South Sound 911, I do understand that. Uh, you need more recruitment. So it, would you, what's the barriers as far as would you take straight out peer, peer counselors right out of maybe um, a criminal justice system where they're, where they're in school learning how to get out of, out of detention to uh, be somebody in the population? Would you accept them into your 911 system? Their lived experience. 
And then there's a matrix going around too that was in the coalition meeting the other day. It's supposed to be kind of like two one one. It's going to have bilingual and other things, and it's in a test vote test mode. So it's run by AI. And I sent a leak into the chat to where everybody could try it out. It is a test mode. It is not real. It looks real, but it's 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 not. Um, they they're looking for feedback from everybody, and I've sent it to a few council members and myself, and and it seems to be interesting. But I'm leery on having. It does not take your social security number, but I'm trying to figure out how it tracks the person when they do their calls, when they get connected, and when they get out of the system and put back in the system. There's there's a few discouraging comments about 211, how it takes an hour or two hours to wait just to talk to somebody. And then that's when my phone or or maybe the engagement task force phone start blowing up as well. So I had to I had to quit giving out my number altogether. I just used Messenger. But, but that's that's all I got right there. Courtney, do you wanna do you wanna cover that first part of the question about any kind of tracking? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Tim, for your promotion of 988. Um, that's a valid concern we hear pretty often. I think some of it is uh, maybe slight misinformation. So 988 in Washington state is funded by the state, but it's through kind of a series of subawards that start at the federal level. So we don't actually report anything back to the federal level. We do maintain client records, but only if the person consents to us doing that. Clients have the right to remain anonymous. Um, so I would love to hear more about the, the materials you're seeing that promote it as, as government. I, I, can, I can assume maybe some of the ones that are SAMHSA branded, that could be where, where some of that concern is coming from. But I think for our, which makes sense, and we could definitely take a look at those and see what we can do in the Washington state community engagement and marketing campaign to make that more accessible to people. Um, something else that if you have a client that could benefit from 988 and absolutely just does not feel like it's anonymous enough, the chat service, I mean, people can use a VPN or proxy. And I know there are some people that maybe they would never reach out if that weren't an option. So if that is the only way they can get help and that helps them feel more more safe and more anonymous, that is something I would definitely encourage. And I'm so sorry, I'm getting a, a message that my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully you were able to get part of that. I, I got all of that. But I, I even do a sidewalk chalk for a week, uh, one solid week after Labor Day weekend on 988. And I actually have some peer counselors on site and everything. I, it's just that recently even after the hope team was engaged or is actually engaged now i haven't heard too much feedback other than the fact that it is not something that a homeless person or a government employee would want to call because it is tracked and it would give them a bad reputation for wanting these services so that's why i'm just trying to ask that we pull any advertisement at all that says anything to do with the government on it, that it's strictly a 988. And that's why we have it separated from, you know, the, the 911 system. I, I, I know a board member, Robinson, and I know um, a committee member is Sarah Rumba. So I, I'm very supportive of all this network behind the scenes. But I just, just to make it more effective, that's just one of the requests I have. And thank you for everything you yeah, thank do. you. I Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. And please feel free to email me if there's more specifics you ever hear of. I'd be happy to kind of look into what we could do on our end to help the community feel safer and also incorporate their feedback. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Courtney, did you also see the, uh, do you see the, the question from Cassie in the chat there? I mean, to read that, I am curious if 988 anticipates any challenges as they establish dispatch protocols for newly endorsed community and crisis teams and rapid mobile response teams that may impact service procedure. Whoa, that was a great question. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Cassie. That's a great question. I think like we talked about, like the no wrong door approach and kind of the one stop call for someone to get their needs met is our goal. And that's going to include a lot of collaboration with uh, mobile teams and, and 
newly endorsed uh, community crisis teams too, like the HOPE team. So we just need to make sure that we follow a pretty structured process for establishing those protocols so that they're consistent and streamlined. And so typically that involves working with the Behavioral Health Administrative Service Organization and identifying what protocols are already in place and creating new ones or tweaking those as needed. So I think with anything like that, there's always the the inevitable challenge of just making sure that this is going to work for the community member, making sure it's going, to, they're not going to feel any clunkiness on their end. So I think what we can do to mitigate those challenges is just make sure we're having regular meetings with um, like Carolon for Pierce County and then also uh, Cassie with your team. Um, and I'd be happy to connect on that more. I think we have some things set up, but would love to just increase the frequency of meetings if that would help. I love this. This has been such an amazing conversation. Uh, Courtney, Diana, Penny, thank you guys so much. I want to uh, recognize the time because I know you all said you had to bounce at 1030. But I just I appreciate this conversation. It's been very helpful to me. I mean, again, as somebody who's so passionate about how we're connecting our community and how we get these resources out there. I often um, I <laughs> I don't know how tomorrow and I talk about this, but I often feel like for myself, I feel guilty sometimes that I know so many resources in the community. And my dream is that everybody in our community, both our providers, our community members can have the knowledge of just how to connect to those resources that I do. Um, I think that's a great thing to put out there. And I, you know, again, coming together like this, this is what, this is what makes it happen. And two in one is, you know, that it honestly hasn't been around too. I mean, it's been around a while, but we've done so much in increasing capacity and adding on like transportation and housing and coordinated entry and, you know, even like birth to five. I mean, they have just done so much. The system is only expanding. It's only getting better. We see that with 988. So I just encourage everybody to keep having these conversations, give that feedback because the more that we advocate for it, funding is always a huge thing. It's a, it bars our capacity all the time. There is a lot we can do together to increase that and, and expand 211 and 988 and, you know, get those calls down on 911, but we, we can't do it. But again, I'm so appreciative of the three of you. It is 1030. Um, if you have to bounce, I will. Did you have any last comments that you, that you want to make? Like, oh my gosh, the task force is so amazing. You guys are incredible. Oh my gosh, the task force is so amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. No, I'm really, really grateful. I I thank you for making this happen. Thank you all for being so gracious. And again, thank you for being honest and transparent and speaking up. Um, I wish, I wish, I wish I was in more meetings where I could get feedback this valuable and make um, these kinds of connections that we hope will lead to improvement. And so just thank you. And thank you for all of your support. Yes, thank you so much. Agreed. Thank you for having us so that we can share where we're hoping to get and what we're already doing today and letting us be part of your group. Um, and Tim, I think you had a question about hiring at South Sound 911. I may have made that up and you might have been asking about 988 hiring, but um, we are always hiring. We take people from you know all over the country, but I love it when they're kind of homegrown and they want to serve the community that they live in. I think it brings a different passion to the job. Um, there is a background portion of the hiring process. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, like criminal history uh, kind of makes you not a valid candidate for our hiring list. I could look into that information and send it over to you though. I know it's not you know, any type of criminal history. It, it's I think certain pieces or maybe a time element. Uh, would that information be helpful to you? Absolutely. It's just that there's other, there's people that have had misdemeanors or stuff like that, or, you know, it's not like the hardcore criminals to get in there. It's, I'm just looking at other barriers for other people. Um, I, I have been promoting with the, the peer counselor, Washington peer counselor association, which is somebody way out in Spokane that I know, um, and just kind of networking to get you a diverse of people in multi-cultures. Um, like, uh, Tacoma Community House, and then you have the Asian Pacific Culture Center. You know, I, I got a couple multi-language people. I've been kind of just report. I think you got three 
three classes coming up. Isn't that what's, yeah. So I've been sharing those. And as long as you make an event, then other people will see what's going on. And then I can share those events and then they'll, they'll know what's up. So um, just low barrier people would need to know that they have, they can have a purpose in life. And that's what I'm looking at. Just trying to say, hey, well, if you don't think you can drive a forklift, well, how about saving people's lives at this? You, you don't think you can be a paramedic or a fireman. How about trying this? And I just wanted to give them an opportunity. I definitely appreciate that. Is your email in the chat? Sorry, there's a lot of people in here. Um, you can get me at Tacoma Outreach at Yahoo.com. And then I've also had Tacoma Volunteer Outreach and Resources on Facebook. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we went from, first off, thank you ladies so much. I appreciate it. We went from providers to um, HR services and hiring and recruiting. You can't come up in here and recruit people for jobs, okay? Don't be taking people from the team. You can't do that. But no, thank you guys so much. Absolutely incredible. Um, man, just what you guys do, keep doing it. Any way we can support. You guys are always welcome to come back and um, send whoever you feel needs to be in these spaces with us. And uh, Let's just continue to keep growing. Uh, Tamari, want to again thank you. If uh, we're gonna move into updates now, right, Chloe? Where are we at, Chloe? Yes, we didn't even get now. through. <laughs> Chloe, we got through one of our questions we worked so hard on yesterday. I know, I know. <laughs> That's I told you it was gonna That's pop great. off like That's that. Organic, genuine discussion. Like this is this perfect. It all worked out in the end. I know it did. Let's go into updates, Chloe. What do you think? Let's talk. Uh, um, tomorrow, Chloe, do you guys want to be in again? We have so many new faces. Uh, shall we cover all of our committee groups today? And if we don't necessarily have an update, maybe we just talk about a little bit about what it is and how we can have some of these wonderful, hopefully all of these wonderful folks join us in our mission mm -hmm. to change the world. Yeah, I think so. That sounds like a good plan. And before we head in, because I'm going to put in our general task force email. So if anything stands out to you and you're like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I want to be a part of that. You can just email that one email and we'll we'll get you connected with those people. So I'm just going to do that real quick as we get started. But um, Kelly, do you want to start off with outreach and engagement? Well, no, that's why I passed it off to you because I'm trying to write stuff in the chat. Tamara, why don't you go ahead and... <laughs> Yeah, I can start. I don't no, mind. No, no, that that is not what we're going to do. Oh, oh man. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna. Okay. Uh, do you want me to you start? Wanna, no, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. Um, <laughs> when we talk about, and I'm because Sam couldn't be here, so I'm I'm gonna make sure that I got his dialed in for business. Uh, the small business engagement group, and then you know, uh, Chloe could do her thing, and then we can keep rocking from there. But um. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. It's always fun to be able to be with you guys and um, just to have a platform that we can all just be together, have truthful conversation. And I mean, just be honest. I think sometimes we hold back what needs to be said because we're worried about how it affects other individuals. But, you know, as Penny said, they need to know that information. They need to know that feedback so they can go back and make the changes that need to be made on their side as well. So with Sam not being here, Sam, so he supports the Small Business Engagement Group, which is actually incredible. They're really focused on um, Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic um, small businesses throughout our town. How do we get them resources? How do we bring them support? What that looks like? So um, some news on their side of things uh, with Workforce Central partnering with uh, Me Central and the Black Collective to be able to deliver more services to um, our small businesses in Pierce County. Um, the Small Business Engagement Group will start meeting again late April. He's really excited about it. Again, wanted to make sure that everything was dialed in first before that group started to run and gun again. So um, lots to come from the Small Business Engagement Group. If that is something that you are interested in or you know a small business group that needs to be connected with that group. Um, again, that group is to find out what is needed in small business, how we best support small business and uh, really elevate and highlight those businesses that are in our community that are usually overseen 
or forgotten because they don't have the marketing capabilities or maybe they're new and they just haven't been around long enough. So trying to make them where they have a group that they can talk about concerns and just get better understandings on um, how to get the longevity out of their businesses. So small business engagement group, more to come. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over. What did you say to me? I'm still over here trying to find you know the task what? force. You know what? You. I found it. I found it. I'm ready. Just Look. Shoot. Boom. There's the task force group Facebook page right there. Okay. Um, Perfect. It, it is a private Perfect. group, but you can ask to join. And all I'll right. let you. That's great. And I'll, I'll send out the link to all this stuff too. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So everybody will be getting an email from me later with all of this information. Um, so we can we can have that one in one place. Uh, so I suppose I can go next for our organizational structures group. So that's all focused on DEAI. So diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. Um, we threw access in there because it's extremely important. A lot of times it's not really included. And if people don't have access to what we're talking about, that's we're not really doing what we're supposed to be doing. So um, that is our committee focus on that. Um, it focus, it's focused on quite a few different things um, over the time we've had the group. It's a space for discussion, personal growth, learning. So we focus on that individual level. Uh, and we also focus on broader, more structural things. So from everything from policies to you know hiring practices, we dive into a lot of it. Uh, one of the thing, one of the big things that we did over the past year or so is our Lens of Equity Summit. That was last year. Um, we're gonna be having another one. It was really amazing. We brought together um, almost 250 people um, at uh, Clover Park and we talked, we had a whole day uh, conference on DAI and not just those general discussions of, I wanna do something, what can I start doing? Here's what you can start doing today. So we're really focused on those tangible pieces. It's a really great group. Um, I'm happy to be a part of it and kind of co-lead that. So if anybody's interested in being a part of it, our next meeting is gonna be this month on um, Tuesday, March 19th. Uh, we meet on Thursday third Thursday of every month from 10 to 11 a.m. So if anybody wants to invite for that, uh, feel free to email me. I'll put you on the list. Uh, it's a really great group. Um, we're right now focused on um, looking at 2024, what we want to do throughout the year, and also uh, planning for the next summit, which I think is going to be early 2025. Um, still choosing a date for that. But a lot of exciting things going on. So we'd love to have you if you're, if you're interested in joining. Thanks, Chloe. And I'll do the last update on the Community Engagement and Outreach Committee. Uh, oh, my goodness. What aren't we doing? Uh, we have a whole bunch of events coming up this year. I think first and foremost, on March 15th, we are helping with the Elevate Women's event, which is put on by United Way. That will be held at Star Center, I believe. I saw Joanna on here. We will put a link on the Facebook page to that as well as send it out. Um, that event, of course, is focused on women in our community, uh, transitioning military members, spouse, families, anybody, single moms, um, just women, women all the way around. And that is really about just coming together, uh, talking about some different opportunities in the in the community, having amazing speakers like uh, Shelly Willis, of course, is going to be a keynote, Kristen Ang, and then, of course, offering services like resumes, uh, connection to employment. We have some really good employers there. Uh, the following event that we are putting together, we went a new route kind of this year, as many of you know about Collaboration for a Cause, which is our kind of our flagship event within the task force for outreach. Uh, we've been partnering with uh, as many groups as we can, understanding that it's important for us to go to multiple communities. And I think in partnering with other events, what we've found is a really intentional way to connect with communities through events who have already you know, that have been going on for a while. So with that, uh, on June 5th is our next, is going to be an interesting one. We have really partnered with our uh, our friends and partners in reentry. So we are kind of doing, um, not kind of, we're really doing an event that is really focused on folks coming out of incarceration or who have been formally incarcerated. That will be held um, at the DSHS office in Hilltop on June 5th. I'm gonna go measure out that parking lot today because we about to take it over that's always so fun for me because they always say oh you can have like 30 vendors and i'm like 75 it is we got you so super excited about that 
more information to come. Um, let's see. And then we've had a bunch of, we've had some really exciting stuff happen. Uh, tomorrow, is it too early to talk about Pierce County? Can I talk about Pierce County? just a little bit or not yet it's too early he gave me that look just a little bit um looking to do some partnerships no, with no, no. Said no. my husband said no okay well i'm doing this part uh looking forward to some partnerships with pierce county uh coming some big things are coming down the pipeline i'm going to need a lot of your help with that uh figuring out how we serve out on key peninsula and definitely helping our unhoused folks and of course our focus is on that that you know, those pathways to sustainability, whether that be through housing and resources to career training, education, employment, and so on. But our goal is always that when we have these events, we don't see the same people come back over and over and over because that always says to me that um, me personally, I'm like, wow, well, I, I've got to find some better, some better pathways for folks. So that is our goal. And then as I also talked about the Speakers Bureau, um, again, advocacy is the passion. I've seen it change myself when we get a lot of strong voices in the room. Um, you know, I had a lot of experience in childcare doing that and was able to help facilitate a lot of different laws and, and uh, whatnot in childcare so we can increase access. So I know our voice is powerful. We need more voices. And I'm excited to be at an organization where I can put together amazing people where we can go to the Hill we can join with Penny at United Way. There's a lot of different advocacy opportunities we have. So hopefully we'll start to put together a Speakers Bureau group in the next month and just kind of really hone in on our stories. A lot of us have that lived experience, but can you do it? Can you tell your story in three minutes or two minutes or one minute? Um, so we're going to work on that a little bit so that we can get that out there. And I think that's all the amazing updates I have for today. There's always more. Feel free to call me anytime. Um, email me. And then, of course, we'll send out um, a wider invite for the collaborate. What is it? The Community Engagement Committee. We change our name all the time. We like that, too. We should just be called the Awesome Committee. Anyway. <laughs> I'll have to no. rename it on the website. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, um, yeah, after dealing with you and coffee, I'll be calling 988. Wait, so. did drink a lot of coffee today. Yeah, I'm calling 988 because, <laughs> you know what I mean, you be testing coffee. people. You be testing people. So 988, <laughs> we'll get the call today. Uh, man, every one of you guys, thank you so much. Is there anything that is from the group that they just want to share out, they're excited about? Um, is, any, is there anything that, I? you know what? Somebody say something, because I know there's something great going on. Don't be acting like you're too good to share the good news. This is a space to share good news, too, not just get it. So wait, wait, wait. Free. Wait, before you go, I <laughs> promised McKinley. Hold on, McKinley. McKinley, are you still on? I promised her. I was like, right <laughs> after the... Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. What's up? <laughs> okay, did you want to talk a little bit about, just really quick, what you're what you volunteered to put together for us? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I don't know, Chloe, if it makes sense for us to link up. Um, what I was saying in the chat to Kelly um, was that if folks want to all send me like their flyers, I'm happy to put them all into a shared folder because I know how hard it can be when an email goes out with like a million attachments. I know for myself, it tends to just get buried. Um, like with our... Um, Anyway, so I'm happy to do that and then also compile everything in the chat, kind of like Chloe, what you were saying. So maybe we can like have a document that also goes into that same folder in case people don't have flyers, but we can still make sure that the information is easy to, to grab. Yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. I don't think there's a lot that we want yeah. to do, but sometimes like capacity can be a challenge. So if there's a way to team up on that to make it happen, that would be absolutely amazing. Here, I'm going to put my email in the chat. So please you know, like email me and we can work together on that because that would be wonderful to have that that shared space. We've um, tried, you know, a few different things in the past, different systems. Um, we've got a newsletter, which I want to get up and running again to um, best share that information out. But that would be that would be amazing. So I just put my email in the chat there. And thank you for. Cool. Yeah, um, I'll reach out. And yeah, beautiful. Kelly, if you want to um, like let people know either via email on the list that they can send me their flyers to be dropped into that. Um, that way they also don't, um, you know, like uh, feel like they have to reply all. And then, yeah, so just send it to me individually. And yes, if you have multiple languages, please send me all of them um, because then I'll just create a little subfolder so that they're all in one spot. Um, I'm super passionate about the like resource collection and just, yeah, being able to do this stuff. So really excited to 
have folks to collaborate with on that and just um, make this something that's really workable for the, the group in general. And then hopefully, you know, expand out even further potentially. Mikaeli, I'll send you my flyer. Um, we're having some um, triple P classes here at the Franklin Pierce School District and they're in Spanish yes. this month, this uh, quarter. So I got the new um, flyer from Cynthia too, because I we've oh, um, okay. shared it out with some folks here. So I do have um, that one at least, but yeah, I'll make sure it gets in there. Thank you. Yeah. Don't nobody else got no good news? You're going to mess around, you're going to lose that camera time, and you're going to give it back to Kelly. I'm trying to keep her off the mic because she juiced up right now. I'm trying to keep, <laughs> keep this going without her um, being juiced up on the mic because then she's going to call me after the meeting, and then she's going to keep me busy for the next hour. I, mm -mm, no, somebody hey, else got something. I got, I got a little something coming to the libraries this summer. Starting in May, actually, we're going to be kicking off a series of monthly job fairs that are going to be moving around to different branches throughout the summer, all through the year. Starts in May at Parkland Spanaway. We're so excited about that. Uh, Kelly, I know we owe you guys an email about looking at a C4C to be held. Um, well, we'll get back to you on that. Summer's really booked already. But um, yeah, so every month there'll be one moving around. We'll get more information out as those sites are booked. Uh, make sure and send folks our way to get hooked up with some some job resources. I love it. Congratulations on that too. You know we always love rocking with you guys. Rebecca, what's going on? I see your hand up. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to take this time to invite everyone to our Franklin Pierce Youth First Coalition Coordinator. We meet every third Friday uh, at the Parkland Spanaway Library from 12 to 1 30. For more information, you can visit FP Youth First. And this is a open invitation community meeting. It is open to anyone. Um, we have uh, different organizations to come to our meeting, but I also have a large uh, number of school staff, counselors, ICMs, principals that also come to the meetings. So if you guys have information that you wanna share, I know some organizations wanna get into schools and share some of the amazing resources, um, this will be a great opportunity to connect with those folks. If you have resources that you want to share with um, uh, with Franklin Pierce or the Parkland community, feel free to send them to me. I keep all of our coalition meetings, resources, minutes, and notes on the website. And what I do is I just upload everything into that website, and it'll stay there forever. So if you miss a meeting and there's an amazing resource that you wanted to connect with, it'll it'll be on our website. So it'll live there forever. Love to hear it. I love to hear it. Anybody else who who got something else to share? Um, what, what what you got, Tim? So you know John Cummings, right? You know who he is, my lawyer. So he does the expungements. Um, maybe you can reach out to him too about maybe popping in before he he's running for judge right now too. But before he runs becomes a judge, maybe you could reach out to him to come in to some of your events as well. Just tell him I sent you. Absolutely, man. You know, I appreciate the plug, especially yeah. on them expungements. Yeah, he's uh he's a good person. I've known him for a while, and uh, <clears throat> the other lawyer is not in this area, but he's actually a prosecutor that's also going to start help making changes for the system. And that's Scott Peters. He's running for judge over in University Place. So he's out. This for you how to your eyebrows, how to your makeup, how to your hair. But I'd or reach out to uh, hair, so John. Coming, it just just throwing that out there for you guys to get you some support. Absolutely, no, I appreciate that. And um, man, I think our big news, you know, for the team, you know, uh, people may not realize, you know, how much work every last one of you guys do, and the incredible work that you guys all do. Um, it's absolutely amazing. We love it. We love being able to support you guys and what you do. You know, again, when we don't have to do this work by ourselves, we can also we can do so much more work when we just, you know, get the get the organizations out of the way, bring the people, bring the heart, and then we leverage everything that we have within our organizations to push out. To the um, that's where we get the big win. And uh, with that, you know, I don't know if y'all knew, but I'm gonna tell you now. 
uh, that the task force was recognized and we did win the uh, Washington State Governor's Award for Community Engagement and uh, Servitude. So big win to all of you guys, man, and um, the support that you guys have for us as well, just like we have it for you. So it was an incredible win. It's going to be an amazing year this year. So many things that are just happening beautifully in this community that we call Pierce County. And uh, we're just taking over and we're going to keep supporting each other. We're going to keep doing amazing things. And um, it's just absolutely an honor to be able to rock with you guys. So uh, I know we're getting close to time. I'm going to humbly step away and let Kelly close us out because she's itching at the bit right now to say something. And me and Norman really have to deal with her most of the day. So um, I'll let her entertain you guys so we don't have to. And go ahead, Kelly, do what you do. <laughs> you know, I'm calling both of you in like five minutes. Like, I, oh my God, that was so great. I baby. love your energy, <laughs> Kelly. What's <laughs> no, the no. coffee? Or is this after <laughs> It was a really big cup. Okay, that's <laughs> we talked about this right before the meeting. We we're like, let's try to limit coffee before the meeting. <laughs> oh, I'm getting I'm getting called up. Hey y'all, I just appreciate every single one of you. Just like uh just like my buddy Tamar said, like I uh, thank you guys so much for coming. What an amazing conversation today. I really loved hearing from 911-988 and 211 and like even like seeing like the collaboration that they're also doing together. I thought that was really cool. I mean, it can only, it can only get better. Right. So thank you everybody. I am hoping Chloe copied the whole chat. I think it happens anyway with zoom, right? Doesn't it automatically save? Yeah. I've, I'm, I'm going to go through everything afterwards. It's going to take some time, but I will be sending over all resources, events, um, and we'll be emailing it out to everybody. So you don't have to worry about losing stuff. Yeah, and then we'll get everybody that's on today. Uh, I saw a lot of requests for add me to the list, add me to the list. We'll, so we'll get all of that through the chat too. Rebecca, what's up? You, Rebecca, close us out. Quick question. I just saw a, a, a resource that Rosie shared for Tacoma learners. Um, it is, is this only for Tacoma or is this for unincorporated Tacoma? I'm meeting with a group of high school students after this meeting at Washington High School. Um, so would this be something I can share with them or is this only yeah. for Tacoma School District? This, no, this is for uh, all of Pierce County. I'm so sorry. The name started, we started the work off in Tacoma. It's going to change. It's all Pierce County. It's for uh, youth and families to learn about what's happening. So anyone who's a provider of youth services, we can help you get in there. And so just like we're building out to the county, but we started off at Tacoma. Name change will okay. come in a year or so. Yeah. Thank you. I'll share this. I have a couple of kiddos that are graduating this year and I, I have a prevention club um, and we meet every Wednesday. So yeah, I'll definitely share this with them. Thank you, Rosie. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I will see you all at our next, well, I'm going to see y'all in committees, I hope, or at least talk to you. If not, we will see you in the next task force meeting, which the topic, do we have a topic? Yeah, it'll be on trades in Pierce County. At least that's the plan right now. So I'll be sending out that email once we've we've got things finalized there. Um, stay tuned for a meeting meeting invite for that. Awesome. And we know all the questions that came across today. So let's make sure we do that meeting some justice and get those ahead of time.